What is India's relationship with liberalism? In this episode, we're doing another entry in our series, Liberalism Around the World, where we examine how liberalism expresses itself in different countries and cultures around the world. Today, we are talking about India, and my guest is Gurcharan Das. Mr. Das is the former CEO of Procter & Gamble India, and he's one of India's most celebrated writers. He's written such books as India Unbound, The Difficulty of Being Good, Another Sort of Freedom, India Grows at Night, and many others. And his most recent book is Dilemma of an Indian Liberal. Today we'll be discussing the history of liberal ideas in India, why liberalism has had such a tough time selling itself there, and why liberal ideas and values are still important for India today. As always, thank you for listening to the podcast. If you want to support the podcast, the best way to do that is by becoming a member of the Center for New Liberalism at cnliberalism.org slash become a member. Join a local chapter and make your community more liberal today. Thank you for listening and enjoy the episode. Welcome, everyone, to another episode of the New Liberal Podcast, part of the Center for New Liberalism. I'm your host, Jeremiah Johnson, and joining me today is Gurcharan Das. Mr. Das, welcome to the show. Thank you. We're very excited to have you today. And I, I found your book, the, the Dilemma of an Indian Liberal, was a very, very interesting read, even from the first pages. One of the first things you say in the book is that the Indian temper is liberal. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well, you know, in a country of 330 million gods, no god can afford to feel jealous. So there you are, the origin of liberalism. But I should really go back to 1500 BC, where, where the first text, uh, the first a sort of the first, I don't say religious, but you could say the religious text of Hinduism lies. And there are many, many texts. And this is the Rig Veda. And in the Rig Veda, they pose a question, well, how was the universe, how was the cosmos created? And they're discussing this and uh, figuring out, and they finally well, maybe we should ask the gods. But then the other side, the other chap says, well, hold on, the gods came afterwards, so how would they know? And then <laughs> uh, the, fact, the other fellow says, maybe we should ask the Brahmins. Oh, no, no, Brahmins are always arguing with each other. So we'll just get more and more confused. And, you know, and in the end, they conclude that maybe we just don't know how the cosmos was created. Now, here is the oldest and the most revered text of India, and they conclude in, on a skeptical note uh, that we don't know. There is an example of, 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 of liberalism. In fact, in that text, there's a god called Ka, and Ka is a creator god, but also in Sanskrit, it's an interrogative, meaning a question mark. And at one point, this god is asked, asks uh, another god, well, who am I? And the other god says, well, just what you said, you, uh, uh, Ka. And, and the fellow says, you mean I'm a question mark? <laughs> So, then so it goes on. But, you know, in India has this, has an infuriatingly large variety. It's given birth to Buddhism, Sikhism, and Hinduism of many of sorts, both uh, monotheistic as well as polytheistic. And so the mantra of India is really Starva Dharma Sambhava, meaning respect for all faiths. 
all religion. That's the way you translate secularism. This is why I say that the Indian temper, uh, I could go on and on, but this is one reason why the Indian temper is liberal. It does seem that India has a, a very unique history. There's probably no other place on earth where so many religions and ways of thinking ha have been so closely intermingled and, you know, and, and lived in such diversity, perhaps. But at, at the same time, you acknowledge there's other parts of Indian history that are very, very anti-liberal, such as the caste system, where it's hard to imagine anything worse for liberal values than than assigning someone a, a value at birth that, that, that they cannot change. Yes, that is absolutely correct. So if you want to talk about the original sin of, uh, of, of India and Indian hi hi religions, it is the the caste system, and 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 um, and it it's it is all that you have just described. I, it is it is the illiberal uh, aspect of India, but because communities have lived together in reasonable harmony, it's India's history was not really a history of religious wars a, a, at all. Uh, I mean, you, we we can't we can't recall a single religious war in our country, and so, and even there's no, there were no caste wars as such. But yes, you're absolutely right that this is uh, the soft underbelly of 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 an, Ill, an illiberal aspect of. Of, of India. There was an interesting phrase you used there, uh, the original sin of kind of Indian culture uh, being the caste system. And I, I think it's fair, you know, if we are going to uh, criticize Indian culture in that way, we should also talk about the original sin of Western liberalism, which is, you know, it, as it applies to India, is the the, the strange pairing of liberal ideas coming to India through British rule, but also being tinged with the touch of colonialism. That, that There's this conflict where the, the British came to India and had these wonderful liberal systems at home of elections and representations and, and beautiful philosophies about equality. But in India, they were, you know, imperial and oppressive and racist, to say the least. Um, you know, they, they, I think in your book, you say they preached liberalism, but they practiced conquest. How does that, uh, how does that kind of form India's ideas about liberalism as it's first being exposed to kind of the Western ideas about liberalism? Yes. Yes. And, and, uh, I'd, I'd say that, uh, the irony was precisely that the British India liberalism, the 18th century or 17th century ideal of liberalism that emerged in Europe was came on the coattails of the British Raj, and the irony was that they were teaching us uh, ideas, uh, and, and and we were embracing with with great gusto the liberal ideas while they, in their behavior, were practicing illiberalism. So there, 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 is, a, there is an irony uh, there, of course. But, you know, Indians being Indians and being argumentative, and uh, they put their own spin on <laughs> the classical ideas of liberalism by adding another Indian dimension to the liberal ideas which was the notion of inner freedom. And, and, you know, Mahatma Gandhi, who was the founder of the Indian, modern Indian state, uh, he, he was a liberal, and he um, told, used to talk to Indians and tell them that, look, you are looking for your, he, he, you know, he, 
was the head of this freedom struggle from colonialism. And he used to tell people that, look, you have to be deserving of also of freedom. In other words, inner side, inside of you, you should also change. Not only that should we get rid of the British and get self-determination and, 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 and home rule, but we should also sort of improve ourselves spiritually and become deserving. We should practice equality and liberty in our life. And he was a great critic of the caste system and, and, and used to call the low caste Harijan, which means people of God. And, 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 uh, and, and, and so I think that, that, and it was not he alone, but many of the thinkers, many of the activists of that time uh, were of the belief that you needed to also purify yourself inside you. You need be in in and and in and in you know my I you you mentioned the book my memoir it's called another sort of freedom and that freedom uh, is my own personal search for um, for, for for freedom for 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 um, um, you know living a, a meaningful uh, purposive life. And, and 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 so I think almost like every it's an Indian <laughs> characteristic <laughs> that the and you know the way I think about it, the West is concerned with the human being and nature. So the great this great uh, the great achievements of the West are science and technology, and the the great uh, genius of the Far East is expressed in the relationship of human beings to another human being. Whereas the genius of India is in the relationship of a, of a human being with himself or herself. So that notion of inner freedom is a very ancient Indian ideal. When I think about all of this, I can't help but think about liberalism as a, a process that is never finished. And I think this is one of the great strengths of liberalism that, you know, that many on the left can kind of get stuck in, you know, classical Marxism and, and debating, you know, what did Marx really mean, which, which you can do that forever and ever because Marx was not the most terribly clear writer. Um, but, you know, liberalism to me is something that is, is constantly evolving, whether it's, you know, a, a, classical ideas from English and French writers come to India and then then are kind of given a new dimension or whether it's just that you know liberalism used to be very flawed you know we can talk about like John Stuart Mill for instance is is one of my heroes uh, intellectually um for what he wrote about women and and his very he was very ahead of his time in in understanding the subjection of women and why that was wrong and yet he was also kind of a racist <laughs> just to be very blunt about it and and he didn't believe that uh, other countries were ready for liberalism and we had to learn that you know uh, he was good in some ways but we actually need to fix his ideas in other ways and and i think that the the fact that liberalism can do that is is part of the the strength of liberalism and you know you, you talked about freedom i i would even throw in another indian thinker uh, amartya sin who is is one of the most influential people I think to have developed the, the idea of freedom in the last several generations? But it, it, I, I I think I don't know. Do you see India as kind of having a part in that and in, in continuing to build on the great tradition of liberalism? Oh yes, I yeah. In fact, you know, even if I think about my own uh, story uh, and the making of a sort of contemporary Indian liberal. Um, I just uh, I'll just recite in a few uh, in a few lines um, my own account that uh, I was born uh, just before we got uh, we threw the British out, you know, and 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 and, and uh, Nehru was our first 
Prime Minister. Gandhi died very soon after independence. And Nehru was a liberal. And, and uh, he, uh, I mean, we, but he was not a, a classical liberal, which is in the sense that he, he embedded in India the institutions of liberal democracy. Certainly, the institutions of de democracy and the constitution that we gave ourselves with the checks and balances, much like your American democracy. And, 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 uh, but he was also a socialist. Now, of course, everybody was a socialist at that time, practically everybody. And so he was applauded around the world for socialism. But he, the only country which was truly socialist at that time was the Soviet Union. And, and from the Soviet Union, I mean, he wanted to have a compassionate, egalitarian society. And so he told his experts and bureaucrats that, look, that's what we should get. And what they delivered was what we in India call the license Raj, which means that they actually created a command economy of sorts. But because we were a democracy, they couldn't have it a command economy. Um, but they certainly micromanaged, over-regulated the private sector. And, and, and so what I wanted to say was, before I get to that, I just wanted to say that I grew up, my father worked for the for, for the government. He was an engineer and he helped build one of the great dams that was built in the 50s called Bhakra Dam. And, and, and it was with great inspiration that these men like my father were, were building this dam. And we were really all socialists at that time, but also a liberal in our ideas about democracy, etc. And when I, uh, when I finished college and I got my first job, it was with a company that made Vicks Vaporub, a company that was in India called Richardson Hindustan in the U.S. called Richardson Vicks. It was an American company, but the Vicks brand was sold in 130 countries in the world, and we were one of those countries. And one year, there was a flu in our country, and I was reasonably, I was moving up the ladder. Uh, we sold a hell of a lot of Vicks paper up as a result of the flu. And we were sort of, we were very happy. We had a very good year and we were, we had grown the fastest of any subsidiary of Richardson Vicks. And just as we were celebrating, uh, we got a summons from the Delhi from, from the government as saying that we had broken the law and I'm, I must appear uh, in, in, in Delhi to explain. And what was the law? It was the license to sell Vicks Vapor Up was based on selling so many tons of Vicks Vapor Up. And if you sold more than that, you had broken the law. And there was a there was a severe penalty. I mean, you could almost you could you you uh, you could go to jail, and the jail, maximum jail sentence was three years for overproducing. And I think it's very hard for you know a Western audience to really fully understand how restrictive the license raj could be at times. The government actually told you what technology you could use, where you would locate the factory how many workers you would have, and all these were to be approved by the government. And the reason for the giving a, a limit on your, uh, uh, on your production was because they didn't want you to become a monopoly. It was the idea that competition, which is a good idea, it's the right idea, a liberal idea, that competition must be there uh, and, and, and so on. But the way they were, they were, the way they were implementing a competition was in this ridiculous manner. 
anyway, I was called to the to explain, and I was treated like a criminal. The the joint the 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 the, the government official kept me waiting outside his office for two hours, and then he I was summoned to him, and he was reading the paper, and he kept reading the paper while I sat quietly, and finally he put his paper down. And 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 he says, "Well, what can I do for you?" Yeah, and I said, "Well, you are the one who called me here, so you know." Uh, he says, "Well, I, I'm not familiar with your case. Tell me what happened." And so I gave him the paper, and which said that we had overproduced Vicks vapor rub, and I explained that there had been a flu, and I also explained that I thought we had produced for the country. We had, uh, we had done our duty. We had kept uh, the. In fact, we had run three shifts to make sure this the shelves were stocked during an epidemic, and uh, so that's our uh, that's what happened. And he said that, uh, but you broke the law, and I said yes. Uh, we were thinking of, to, you know, <laughs> the consumer, and and how to help the consumer, and and he says no, but you broke the law, and are you guys in the private sector are all crooks, especially you multinational companies, you you, you like the East India Company uh, that came here and and look at what it did, and so I want to make an example of your company, and so. <clears throat> uh, I'm sorry, but the law will now take its own course. And he sent me packing. But at the door, I suddenly, I turned, I don't know what got into me, but I turned around and I said to him, Sir, um, you know, this news will get out. You know, every, it isn't every day that a multinational company executive go, goes to jail. And he said, are you threatening me? And I said, well, look, if, imagine if people were to read what happened, and they will read. It will appear in the papers, in the New York Times, and in the Times of India, and so on. They will read the fact that here was a company that helped its people, that helped the people during an epidemic. And this is how that company was treated by the laws of this country. I said, how will our laws look? How will our um, prime minister look to the world? And he uh, said, I've heard you, now get out. And so there I was. I had sleepless nights, but the government, and the government quietly stopped. I mean, they dropped the inquiry, uh, and they didn't tell us. So we didn't find out until we kept... <laughs> <laughs> also, th this whole this whole episode kind of shows that it, India was liberal in the sense of it, they were a liberal democracy. Uh, politically, they were liberal for for many almost immediately, you know, from their independence. But they were not economically liberal for a long time. Can can you explain like what it, what is the history of that? Why was economic liberalism so silent? until, you know, many decades until the 1990s. Exactly. Well, you know, uh, so as far as I'm concerned, I, in the weeks, in the week after, I joined the only liberal party we had in India at that time. It was a Swatantra party. Al alas, it lasted only 12 years. And it was, it, it didn't, didn't succeed uh, beyond that. But when I joined it, it was doing pretty well. So I, had, I, I, from a socialist, I became uh, a, a, a classical liberal, and and, uh, and 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 frankly, the reality is that the government, this the officer who interrogated me, was a a leftist, a Marxist, and uh, that was the way that the opinion. In the country was the um, there was a suspicion, and you know this is ironic. I must tell you, because India was had always a tradition of entrepreneurship. I mean, I could tell you wonderful stories from 
uh, ancient times about merchants and 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 uh, there's a particularly good one mm -hmm. called the mouse merchant i, I would <laughs> i would also point out just that that india has also a tradition a very important tradition of breaking the law when it is morally correct to do so this is this is the land of gandhi and I, I imagine this this man trying to tell gandhi you know well it doesn't matter that you're morally correct you broke the law so <laughs> you know the reality is that we finally got our economic freedom in 1991. So, you know, you, you originally asked me the question about evolution of liberalism. And the evolution of liberalism in India, it, the, it was liberalism, ironically, that got us to get the British out of India. It was the liberal idea of freedom and liberty that uh, we actually, go <laughs> partly from the British we got it, but we have another, we have an ancient tradition of that as well. But nevertheless, we became politically liberal, but we were economically illiberal. And so India was admired around the world for its democracy and amazing freedom, but no economic freedom. So it was really 1991 when the reforms came and the, because the economy was in trouble. And by the way, the first 40 years of our, from 1950 to 1990 um, of, our, of our history, these 40 years, um, you know, we in fact sacrificed two generations of our country, a country which always had a great entrepreneurial tradition. We sacrificed to missed opportunities for young people because in the name of poverty, that's what they were trying to do. They were going to eliminate poverty through socialism. They did very little for socialism. It is only after 91, it's in the last 30 years when the economy, India's economy became the second fastest for the next 30 years, second fastest growing major economy in the world, and today it is the fastest growing economy in the world. And it was done through the old-fashioned way of entrepreneurs creating wealth. And, and, and in this process, India lifted 400 million people above the poverty line. You know, the World Bank poverty line that is there of $1.90 per day. We, and, and we, our middle class grew from 10% to 32% 30, 30, uh, that it is today. And all this because, and so we actually were a democracy. We got democracy before capitalism, <laughs> in a way you can say that. Uh, because and 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 it is and now frankly uh you know we are poised uh, i mean we can we can, let let me leave it at that we, maybe i'll wait for your next question i think it's very interesting but to and we can transition to talking about you know india's more current day issues but it, one of the things that you say repeatedly in the book is is how difficult it is for liberalism to win in india at least politically, you say it's a very difficult job to sell liberal ideas in India. And yet, at least from the outside, it certainly looks to me like, you know, it, all of India's growth and prosperity and and all of these good things that have happened in Indian society are so closely linked to liberalism. It, it's linked to opening up and, and big companies are being founded and, and the technology revolution, the IT revolution has reached India. And all of this is obviously not because of a, a government decision or a, you know, a government program. This is capitalism at work. And it, it seems to me like there's an obvious case that, uh, look, liberalism is good. Liberalism creates wealth. Why is it that that seems to be the case and yet it is still very difficult to sell liberal ideas in India? Well, you know, uh, I, 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 this is a very good question. But let me begin by saying that this 
soil of India is liberal, and until the until the uh, the, 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 the the socialist uh, ideas came to India, and they they were alien ideas. Socialism, Marxism, was an alien idea, um, and before that, actually, forget in in our 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 the the merchant is a one of, a high caste individual and and respected in our in our society and and what happened though is that 40 years of socialism really made indians feel may, may, you know they I mean, that was a very heavy dose and 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 after 91 while we opened our economy and capitalism has flourished the fact of the matter is that no one no leader of india has sold the market to the people in other words uh, and, and and the people who were very would have been very receptive to this idea uh, we have not had a leader like margaret thatcher in the uk who used to say that i spend 20% of my time reforming and 80% of my time selling the reforms. And she, in fact, converted the British public, which was very socialist minded, to, uh, and even the Labour Party changed, you know, the new Labour with Tony Blair, etc., uh, a new way of thinking. In India, uh, be because we didn't have a leader like that, and the leaders initially reformed because they had to. That India's economy was in a crisis. So it was a sort of reluctant step that, and not a step out of conviction that these leaders taking. You see, the same party was in power, the Congress party, which is a left of center and which had been preaching socialism all these years, was suddenly had the job of opening the economy. And we neither did we have a leader like Deng Xiaoping, who in China converted the Chinese people to the markets. And so the market also is not an easy sell. You know, it's very it's not easy for the common individual to understand that people working for their own uh, selves, for their self-interest, for their profit, millions of people eventually lead to an invisible hand. That's what Adam Smith called it. An invisible hand creates, it raises the whole society to pros from poverty to prosperity. You can't, the voter cannot see the invisible hand and no politician is willing to bet on it because the results of the market come slowly, you know. The market is, um, I mean, the the uh, politics. You know, is you're in you're in your you get elected, and the voter gives you four or five years to see how good you are. And for a, a liberal, um, the, the liberals will say to the voter, "Look, I will create conditions for investment. Factories will come." jobs will be created, and we'll be prosperous. Whereas the guy who's competing against the, the candidate who's complete, competing against the liberal candidate, he'll say, I will give you free electricity from the day I get elected. And that's what politicians have done. And so who do you think the voter will vote for? The guy who gives free electricity. And so there you go. It's not easy. And that's why, frankly, the Liberal Party died in India and, and nobody has come today. I mean, a Liberal candidate has no, has no, ch has no chance <laughs> so because we, all the other candidates are promising all these freebies. And the Liberal says, well, you know, I'll improve the schools. I'll improve the skills of the people. 
and the people and then people will say oh god it'll take 5 years 10 years for us to see that and 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 somebody is giving them uh free uh this and free that uh do you think they'll vote for the liberal no the other thing that you can't ignore i think if we're going to talk about uh, indian politics today is the rise of hindu nationalism uh, historically obviously india has had many socialist governments that that lean far to the left and we talked about the license raj but today uh, modi's government of you know a, a kind of a form of right wing muscular hindu nationalism seems to be much more in, in power and much more ascendant how does how, how do you think about that i guess as as a liberal does this worry you and what should the liberal response to that be well of course it worries me uh it's a very illiberal idea you know liberals are very wary of nationalism particularly after the damage that nationalism did uh certainly the narrow nationalism of the 19th century nationalism which was about power and and uh i mean there is a good nationalism too but the reality is that the kind of nationalisms that become ascendant in politically ascendant are the ones connected with power and liberals are wary of all kinds of power they're wary of political power they're wary of state power they're wary of economic power they're wary of religious theocratic power uh so mm, it it's a reason to be wary and you know it's again ironical uh it's again ironic that here we were we were we had achieved a true liberal democracy over 40 years then we became economically free and we became uh, the entrepreneurship rose we created the it revolution in the country india became an it power uh in the world um with 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 very successful companies uh with global market share and and uh and 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 just as everything was going well our economy had become the second fastest so here we were both a liberal democracy and a liberal economy that in the last 10 years we have experienced about the same time frankly as when you uh got uh, trump in america uh we got uh modi in india and and uh so what nationalism uh, re- religious nationalism particularly and you know i'm a child of the partition uh which means i don't know whether how much americans know but we we got our we got our freedom in a very liberal manner thanks to people like gandhi and nehru but we the partition of the country led to riots religious riots between hindus and muslims because they split the country up into muslim majority areas to create pakistan and so i was one of the persons who was caught on the wrong side where i was in lahore as a child as a four and a half year old child and we discovered that pakistan that lahore had been awarded to pakistan and already killings of hindu started and we had to run for our lives and luckily we crossed the border safe although my aunt got killed in it and 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 things i've described in another sort of freedom my memoir and and so i have been always suspicious of religion uh for that for that reason and 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 so really um my point is that religious uh hinduism actually is a is a, is 
is a very private religion in which everything goes in the sense that it allows you to, as I told you, 300 million gods, but also you can, you can be, um, you know, the, uh, what matters is not your belief, but what your way of life. It, Hinduism is a way of life. And so it's, it's, it's by definition a, a, a liberal uh, place. And we have Buddhists who we have, we have given Buddha. Buddha became one of the uh, incarnations of Vishnu. And so we embrace Buddhism as well. And, 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 in, and even when the missionaries went to, came to India, the British missionaries, uh, the Indians uh, welcomed them and they said, Oh great, we'll make Jesus into one of our gods. And would you like him to be an uh, uh, incarnation of Vishnu or Shiva? He, he, we give you that choice. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the missionaries, yeah, no, no. Mi missionaries just ran it's, away. And that's why only 2% of India <laughs> became Christian. So um, it, it's, it's one of those very absorptive uh, cultures. And, 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 and so it's ironical that there should have been any religious... Uh, we didn't have a history of religious wars as you did in the West. Was a until, until the partition started the conflict. And, and it's, it's so, it's so un, unnecessary where, you know, I imagine your family had lived in Lahore peacefully for, for many years, but then someone draws a line on a map and all of a sudden there is violence and you have to leave. I mean, call, I, I, the only way I can explain it is temporary insanity. And the temporary insanity is much bigger in groups and even bigger in religious groups. So I'm very wary of politics in religion. And that's why I'm so wary of these people, who are the Hindu nationalists, because they're playing with fire. There's no need. You know, India is already 80% Hindu. So why would you, you ask, should a Hindu feel insecure in his own country? And, and this is the very odd part of it. And, you know, frankly, it goes to, the, to another flaw of liberalism itself. And shall I, shall I explain that uh, to you? Uh, Absolutely, yeah. The, 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 the flaw of liberalism is that in our obsession with individualism, the liberal is, is basic DNA of a liberal is individualism, individual liberty. But human beings live in groups. They're sociable. They're sociable animals. And and liberalism doesn't quite know what to do with people in groups. And, and so um, there's always been this tension, even in the 19th century. The Romantics were upset by the fact, by the Industrial Revolution, and, and how it was creating workers who were alienated from the family. Their people got transferred to another job in another community, and basically the loss of community. And in, in the case in India, even though, um, you know, the Hindus may be 80%, but the fact is liberalism has been an elite project. It's, it's, it's an elite project, particularly um, in India, where the irony is that it's English-speaking, middle and upper middle class, which is the great supporter of liberalism. Now, English, um, about 10% of the people are fluent in English and about 15% are comfortable in a degree of English. Now, 15% is uh, uh, over 150 million people, um, is, is, is a lot of people. And that's why you have phenomena like Bangalore and these great cities, which are Hyderabad and so on. But nevertheless, if you are a young person 
a bright young person who walked into a, a, a you see because sorry let me just stop one second and say that 75 years after independence all the serious work of india whether in the private sector or in the public sector is still done in english and so what i'm saying if you're one of the 85% and you walked in to a, a meeting which was going on uh where they were discussing everything in english you'd feel deaf imagine feeling deaf in your own country 75 years after independence that's and do you think this this kind of disconnect this this you know liberalism is something that the educated elites do and they all speak english and they seem to be very different from me who is a very common person in india do you think that has something to do with the rise of of hindu nationalism well it's it, it, exactly and in 2014 and when mr modi came to power you had a social you it was a social revolution as well because the mr modi is is his first language is not english it's is 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 gujarati hindi and he expressed he only speaks in hindi and whereas mr nehru would speak in english a lot and and the reality is that we i mean we can't have our problem is the reason we have english is because we have 22 official languages in <laughs> india and so uh, you know you if anybody tried to impose any of their languages you would have you break up the country so insensibly they kept english going as a and until hindi may be developed or an a, a mixed language got developed which is developing right now and 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 about 50% people understand hindi partly from bollywood movies and so on anyway my point is that language is yes that language is one of the reason and 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 also class because mr modi's family was father was a tea stall uh, and on a railway platform he served tea to to passengers and modi recalls his time helping his father serve tea to passengers he was so his class was what we call obc other backward caste one of the other backward caste and so the chap today the guy who is a rickshaw driver or a small mom and pop shopkeeper these people suddenly saw got dignity there was a dig the social revolution where the other backward caste uh got felt that their own guy was in office and it was finally their own country and and that is part of the revolution um and 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 and, and then i'll explain why is it that it's a hindu nationalism so one so it's it's it's, it's the other search for community uh is been the fact that Hindus frankly we have um my father was a mystic but he belonged to a monotheistic side of hinduism which looked down on the the millions who had worshiped the the the, the shiva and krishna and all the idols we we believed in a a, a, a god which was non uh but you know the whole idea <laughs> was that even the the hindu and uh, who has who has 300 million gods knows it in same breath he will say oh yes but we also have one god and because these all gods are symbols uh, of of that one god anyway my point is that the the most islamic the muslims the the british the the christians and also the reformist sects uh, sects in hinduism like my father's sect we look down 
on these people with their gods. And so these people have felt uh, a sense of um, inferiority that, look, our gods are looked down upon and these people look down on us. And so it was a risk. The, uh, the rise of Modi was an expression that our guys in office, now we can assert our own gods, our own way of life. And so that insecurity, I think, is responsible for the, the, the Hindu insecurity for this nationalism. But let me add one more thing, that the mistake of the intelligentsia after independence, the elite, has been that no one has actually taken the trouble to talk to people in their language, in the language of dharma. That's our civilizational language. And Gandhi was the last, Mahatma Gandhi, the one who got us, who got us independence without shedding an ounce of blood. He was able to speak to people in the language of the people, in the language of dharma. He converted the ideas of liberty and equality into the ideas of dharma. And people fought those ideas, but he died too, too soon. And no politician after that from any party has engaged with the people at their level. And this is another reason for the rise of Mr. Modi and Hindu nationalism. There's one issue that I, I found your book only touched on a little bit, and I'd love to explore it more. Because certainly one of the most important divides in India is that between the cities and the rural areas. And, and perhaps this also touches on the difference between the elites who speak English and, and the working class people who do not. But, you know, the, India is a place where if you look at, if you look at certain parts of India, it is it, there are rich areas with you know highly educated intelligent people working for multinational corporations who can you know they can think i'm going to become a millionaire and found a company of my own and and they can be just just like any other rich place in the world practically and there are also parts of india where you know they're very rural and poverty is very very heavy and they're unequal and rights for lower castes or women may still be, you know, it, in a practical sense, not guaranteed. And there may be a lot of oppression and, and conservative uh, behavior there. How does this divide between the, the kind of the, the two different Indias play into the politics? And, and, and what would a liberal say we need to do about it? Well, the liberals answer is economic growth and i may we are proud of the fact that we've had six percent real growth that's net of inflation in the last 30 years but we still we have not created an industrial revolution we've become a, an agricultural powerhouse we are now the fourth largest uh, ex exporting. We were an importer of food, believe it or not, uh, in the 1960s. But we had a green revolution and we have become, we've had a, an, but we jumped from a green revolution to an IT revolution, to a digital revolution, to the point that there are more digital transactions that take place in India each day than and the whole world combined. And so the reality though is that 45% of India is still on the farm. That is the people, the agriculture, which represents only 12% of GDP, employs 45% of the people. Now you can't take that 45%, the surplus people, to an IT job, but you, you need to go through that missing step of the factory. And that's where the 
the reality is that fact that we did not sell the market, the fact that we did not, people, we, we still have to do reforms which will make India more competitive in the world. And we still need to, you know, the fact is that East Asia rose on the basis of one mantra, Asian tigers, the latest one being China, from Japan, Korea, Taiwan, all these countries became rich on the basis of the export of labor-intensive manufacturers. India's, in, in India, labor-intensive manufacturers represent only 16% of GDP. It should be double of that. I think there's a, a real chance there too. I mean, it, it, we will see. We will see in the future. But you know, it it's definitely the case that in China, you know, people built so many factories in China because labor was very, very cheap. But labor is no longer very cheap in China. Uh, you know, it's still cheaper than America, but it's not cheap compared to Vietnam or India. And I think you see. There's an opportunity that, you know, India has an opportunity if they take it to actually take some of that manufacturing from China um, and, and grab some of that growth for themselves. You know, someone like like Bangladesh has certainly had a, an industrial revolution in the sense of the garment industry and and, and, and things like that. So it, it, I, I don't know if they will do it, but I certainly think there's an opportunity Yes, you're absolutely right. And the preconditions for that industrial revolution are far better today. In the, in the last 10 years, ro not last, uh, since 2011 to 2021, the road mileage in the country in, has doubled. Infrastructure has really improved. The port handling capacity has quadrupled through the goods and services tax. India has created one nation before there were 22 nations. Every state had its own tax system. And, you know, trucks would have to wait at the checkpoint uh, to get clearance from one state to the other. All that friction has gone. Uh, and so, actually, India, and plus this disillusionment with China, it's not because of high labor costs alone. It's because of the political climate of China is turning hostile. And so India does have that opportunity today, but it's not an inevitable. In other words, India will have to do the reforms to realize that destiny. And, 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 and so actually the, 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 the issue today um, is that we and 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 i think at least M modi's government recognizes this issue and the from my perspective the dilemma of the indian liberal is that modi's while the i couldn't i can't vote for mr modi because of his illiberal um hindu nationalism and I, uh, but he is, he's shown a far better executional ability. The way infrastructure has grown and the, it's all done in the, on, on, through very responsible budgeting. It's not just taking on debt after debt. It's, it's responsible budgeting. Uh, revenues of the state have gone up. And so, I, I mean, I'm, you to give the devil his due, I mean, I must uh, confess that I certainly feel a lot more confidence in his ability to do those reforms than I do with the opposition. The opposition, I'm sorry to say, has had last 10 years, they haven't come up with one good idea to solve the real problems of India, like jobs and so on. And the DNA of the leading opposition party, Congress party, is a DNA where they will always uh, trade off 
growth for it's a false trade off between growth and equity. Their approach is, oh my God, you know, that's the old socialist approach. You're poor, here we'll give you we'll give you some some uh, money or some free, you know, uh, what whatever free uh, uh, things and w w whereas a liberal will say that look we we only the private sector creates jobs and so our approach would be to create conditions for the flourishing of the markets and 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 and, and so on anyway you know that that's the, that's what made that's what made uh, east asia rise that's what made the west rise and it's the standard formula and the that dilemma is that i can't vote for the opposition nor can i vote for mr modi so there i am lonely in the middle and i have lost my friends on the left and i've lost my friends on the right because i criticize the left for being uh, as socialist, for being populist, for being status, whereas the right is uh, majoritarian. It doesn't allow. It doesn't want dissent. In other words, it is it's leading us into an illiberal democracy. So that is really the unfortunate. Uh, Dilemma of the liberal. We are coming up on time now, unfortunately, because I, I could, I feel like we could, I could speak for hours on this, but I will ask the traditional final question that we always ask at the end of our podcast, and that is, where can people go to learn more? I am happy to recommend your book that if people want to learn about liberalism in India, you should pick up a copy of. The Dilemma of an Indian Liberal by Gurcharan Das. But uh, other than your own book, uh, is there something you would recommend for people who are, are listening to this, you know, who are, who are not Indian, but who are fascinated by India's history and by Indian politics and, and liberal ideas in India? Is there anything you think they should read or watch or anything that would help them learn more about what we're talking about today? Uh well, there are lots of books on liberalism, and certainly the dilemma that I face as an Indian liberal should be familiar to many people in the West. Uh, it should be certainly familiar to, to, to people in America, the UK, and, 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 and many other countries. Uh, so the... the, the Fukuyama's book, Liberalism and Its Discontents, is another uh, very good book because it shows the, some of the flaws in liberalism that we spoke about. And he's gone and also talked about why, where ne neoliberalism went too far uh, and is responsible for some of the problems that exist. Uh, and... and uh, as to, um, I mean, I, I was thinking of uh, uh, Farid Zakaria's book on illiberal democracies. Um, he, wrote an, he wrote an article in Foreign Affairs called The Rise of Illiberal Democracy in 1997. Then later, it was a book. Uh, I can't immediately recall the, the title of it, but that's another book. So those will those are very good, I think, uh, uh, to understand where liberalism is worldwide. As for India, um, I think the works, the the things I talked about, the liberal Indian liberal temper, uh, and I talked about how Indians put a spin on liberalism. There. Is a book by a man called Dalton, D A L T O N, about freedom in India. And he's talked, it's, it's biographies of a number of Indian liberals, including Gandhi. And what is that spin that Indians put on the Western notion of liberalism? 
which caught on, which, 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 which resonated with the people in India. Now, as to the present situation of, of the liberal, they're, they're, um, um, I'm, I'm, I'm scratching my head as a liberal. If anybody has, um, there, there were books about how the British behaved illiberally but spoke liberally uh, in the 19th century. Uh, Uday Mehta wrote, his, uh, wrote a book about, about that. Uh, I think Empires and Liberalism, something like that. All, and and uh, I, sh I should really look at my own bibliography in my book <laughs> to, uh, to, to give you some names. Uh, shall, I, shall I get that? Let me, if you... I, I think you've already given us many good recommendations. I, I, I certainly have a reading list to now to go look at. Um, so I, I, I think that's fine. But I mean, if, if again, I will recommend also just The Dilemma of a Liberal, and that has a, a selected bibliography inside of it that, uh, that people can take a look at. Um, so I mean, that, I, I think that's a great reading list. Um, I, I want to say thank you one more time uh, to my guest today, Gurcharan Das. Mr. Das, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Well, thank you. On the contrary, it's been very enjoyable talking to you.